Hello, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us for an Olana webinar. I'm Gracie Mills, Education Manager at the Olana Partnership. Before we get started, I just want to give a special thanks to you all for joining us here on Zoom, especially to our members whose continuous support makes programs like this possible. You can become a member or learn more by visiting olana.org slash membership. We have numerous upcoming public programs and events this season, and you can learn more at olana.org slash programs dash events. Now, please join me in welcoming the moderator for tonight's talk, Carolyn Keough, Director of Education and Public Programs at the Olana Partnership. Thanks so much, Gracie. Gracie. Um, I'm so excited for our speaker tonight, and I'm really looking forward to everything that Aaron will be diving in with us. So it's my absolute pleasure to welcome Aaron Monroe for this evening's we webinar. Aaron is the Creeble Curator of American Paintings and Sculpture at the Wadsworth Athenaeum in Hartford, Connecticut. She, is, she has led the department since 2016 and oversees an extensive collection encompassing colonial portraiture, 19th century landscapes, neoclassical sculpture, modernism, surrealism, and mid-century abstraction. Drawing upon the strengths of the museum's holdings, she has curated Andrew Wyatt, Looking Beyond, Gory's Worlds, and Paul Manship, and Ancient Made Modern, the first museum exhibition on the artist in 30 years. She served as the in-house curator for Milton Avery, organized by the Royal Academy of Arts, and Frederick Church, a painter's pilgrimage, organized by the Detroit Institute of Arts. Monroe holds Aaron Monroe holds an MA in Art History from Hunter College and obtained a BA in Art History from Northwestern University with a minor in African Studies. Welcome, Erin. As I mentioned, I'm just so excited for this presentation on Charles Ethan Porter and the lineage he shared with Church as a fellow Hartford artist. So without further ado, I'll let you dive into it and tell us a little bit more about Porter and, and some of the shared connections with Church and where he deviates. We're really excited to learn more. Thank you so much. Um, it's my pleasure uh, really to be here and to uh, really help contribute to a deeper interest and level of inquiry into Charles Ethan Porter. Um, I'm going to share my screen and also continue um, the thank yous, uh, notably to um, Carolyn for inviting me to participate in this series, Gracie for some uh, tech support and um, Sean Sawyer and Betsy Kornhauser who visited Hartford not long ago um, to kind of plant some early seeds for um, really the exciting um, commemoration of um, Frederick Church's 200th, 200th anniversary of his birth, which um, is in 2026, which I'm sure you'll be hearing more about. Um, before I begin, I also want to acknowledge so many scholars, um, art dealers, curators, who have worked hard um, both decades ago and more recently to bring Charles Ethan Porter to light. And I want to name a few, include Cynthia Hawkins, Elizabeth Young, Dean Luddy, and the dealer Tom Colville, all of whom I've reached out to in about uh, the past two years for various reasons. And also tip of the hat to many of the Connecticut museums and colleagues there um, who hold works by Porter, um, some of which hang regularly and some are newly acquired, which is also part of the conversation. And I'm looking forward to uh, some of your thoughts and questions about um, this artist. But I do want to say um, really the connectivity to church is uh, really exciting. And I'm, you know, time and time again, really interested in what was 19th century Hartford like um, during Church's time and, and Porter's time. So I'll be weaving through some archival imagery, um, some of the other kind of art and cultural notables that were in the city, and kind of shed light on the context of Porter's life and work and the time that he did spend in Hartford. Of course, I, I called my title, um, I excerpted it from a review of one of Porter's shows in which he was claimed to be the Hartford artist, but uh, I might actually put a question mark at the end of that uh, phrase because 
he lived and worked uh, elsewhere, including New York City and several years in Paris. So while it's um, a little hometown pride to create that moniker, uh, I certainly don't want to oversimplify his accomplishments and, and his career. Before I delve into Porter, I'll just quickly offer, there are two extant photos of him, uh, this being one. Um, the picture on the right is just um, him second from the right uh, cropped, so you can see him better. And very, very, very few letters. Um, really, the primary source materials are letters um, from other individuals who, to whom Porter wrote uh, and vice versa. And um, really, newspaper articles have been tremendously helpful. Of course, that's one side of the coin, though, as it were. But for those of you that don't know, the Wadsworth Athenaeum is located in the heart of downtown Hartford. Uh, we are on Main Street. Uh, here you see this uh, Gothic Revival building, which our namesake, uh, Daniel Wadsworth, um, helped uh, really erect and fund in 1842. And we opened our doors in 1844. So you can see in this uh, image on the top from 1910, our campus has grown to five different buildings, each with a different architectural moment. And our collections, which the core grouping were literally Hudson River School landscapes by people like Thomas Cole, Frederick Church, Albert Bierstadt. Cole and Church in particular um, are really closely connected to our founding collection. Many of the works we acquired were literally months or, or barely years um, when they were completed on the easel and then found their way into our collection in large part because of Daniel Wadsworth's patronage of American art. But today we boast uh, nearly 50,000 works spanning from antiquity to contemporary. So a little bit of everything and certainly architecturally that comes across as you walk through the museum. So a little plug if you've not been to the Wadsworth, you now know someone that works there and I would love for you to come for a visit. Beyond um, present day Wadsworth, uh, our 19th century history as a city is quite fascinating in that we were home to many, many notables in arts and culture. On the left, you see Harriet Beecher Stowe. In the middle, you see Mark Twain. And then of course, Frederick Church. Now of these three, Church was the only one born in Hartford, but both Stowe and Twain came to Hartford specifically because it was a thriving city. We had a very successful printing press, which made it appealing to authors. And for someone like Frederick Church, um, his ancestors, he could trace ancestors all the way back to the founding of Hartford. So I will say the recognition of church in Hartford is a modest but very important plaque on Trumbull Street, just a few blocks from the museum. And I hope that there's um, really more interest in and around the 200s that, that can kind of um, bolster that representation. But church is someone um, for whom the city of Hartford held great significance. It was where he was introduced um, through Daniel Wadsworth to Thomas Cole. And as you likely know, had a little bit of a mentorship of Cole. And we were um, one of the first museums to collect and acquire Church's works. And you can see the early date on these, 1846, which incidentally is a, a year or two before Charles Ethan Porter is born. So I wanna kind of set the scene of, you know, what is the mid 19th century like in terms of art, in terms of Hartford? How do those two worlds um, reveal themselves when you look at kind of iconic works like Hudson River School landscapes? And then coming back to Porter, knowing that someone like Church was significantly older and benefited from incredible patronage um, with people like Elizabeth Colt, um, Cyrus Field. I mean, there were notable individuals who helped support Church um, getting his start and, and becoming the successful individual who went on to not only travel the world, but build an incredible place like Olana. Sadly for Porter, that is not the case. Um, certainly his race um, played a, a role in his life and legacy, knowing that he really was growing up and um, working in the post-Civil War era. 
against the backdrop of somewhat optimistic moments like abolitionism and the Emancipation Proclamation, but the reality of um, you know lingering segregation, uh, really uh, the reality of enslavement still being around in, in different parts of the country, including Connecticut after the Civil War. So there are many complicated things that, that Porter faced um, being a person of color. The details of his life are to put it bluntly, really inconsistent. Um, there are incredible scholars who argue for his birth date to be 1847, some say 1849. Um, I've been reading all the scholarship and it's unclear how many children were in the Porter family. I've read 13, I've read 15, but the point is, is uh, really Porter um, was born into a family that lived in Rockville, Connecticut, which is about 10 or 12 miles away from Hartford. Rockville um, is now within a town called Vernon, Connecticut. So you can see this archival photo from the Vernon Historical Society, which is one of the um, sites that can hold, that holds some information about Porter. The circumstances of, of his life and his upbringing are such that um, coming from a very large family, his parents um, themselves tried the best they could um, to support their children, but really it was only Porter that went on to have um, significant degree of higher education. His father, William, um, was born a free man of mixed race ancestry in Massachusetts. And his mother, Mary, was from Ellington, Connecticut, also mixed race ancestry. Um, I believe that Mary was both, had both black, white, and Native American ancestry, which was fairly common in the early 19th century. They um, owned property in Rockville and had really different opportunities and, and limited opportunities given that William is believed to have been illiterate. Mary was literate. Um, William is listed as being a field hand or a laborer in certain census reports. And Mary is listed as a housekeeper or a servant. So um, certainly very difficult times um, raising a, a very large family. And Porter went um, really uh, somewhat rapidly through high school. And after high school, um, really in sort of the 18, 1865 is when he graduates high school. He goes on to uh, a really interesting place, uh, the Wesleyan Academy in Wilbraham, Massachusetts, which was a segregated, excuse me, an integrated school and was integrated even before um, the Civil War. So I've come across a couple different artists and craftsmen that attended the Wesleyan Academy. And I think it's, it's fascinating and I'd love to do a little more research um, into that um, organization. But very quickly, he moves to New York City and he exhibits as early as um, 1871 at the National Academy of Design in New York City, which is an incredible accomplishment. At the time, though, a single painting he exhibited was a still life called Autumn Leaves. So right out of the gate, his establishment as a painter of still life, both floral and fruit paintings, is uh, something for which he is uh, widely known throughout his career. So weaving us back to um, Porter and his early beginnings, we know that he lived in New York for several years, and then he um, actually sets up a studio in Hartford. And I'll show you an image in just a moment, but this is where we get the connectivity to not only Frederick Church, who we know, uh, well, we believe there's been, there's still kind of a, a, a wild goose hunt for the actual location of Porter paintings that are uh, with Frederick Church provenance. But I'm showing you a view of the dining room at Olana for those of you that haven't been, I'm sure many of you have been several times, but the collecting and collections um, of the church family are widely known, but certainly to have a work by Porter meant something. And I wonder, you know, 
how much of that was the Hartford connection or how much of that was church really supporting um, really um, emerging talent in American painting. Similarly, Mark Twain owned um, works by Porter and the Mark Twain house has recently acquired a floral still life and it's might not be the exact one that Twain had, but it's really representative. Um, and you can see in these dining rooms, these really lush interiors where they're, you know, filled with all kinds of um, evidences of 19th century design and everything from glass and silver and china to oil paintings. And really what's fascinating is you think about, okay, we're talking about the Hartford art world and people that were in Hartford, well-to-do collecting. But keep in mind, Hartford was on the map, both as an industrial city and in various instances, um, a key city to um, visit if you're, say, Frederick Douglass and, you know, your abolitionist agenda has you going through major cities in uh, throughout the country, particularly in New England. Here we see Douglas um, on his second visit to Hartford. Of his three visits, the first one, he was not allowed to speak indoors and in fact had to speak under the open sky next to um, a church, which is across the street from the Wadsworth Athenaeum. So if someone like Frederick Douglass um, doesn't have a fighting chance of, of speaking indoors, um, let alone to an integrated audience, um, I, I just can't imagine what Porter's experiences were like. And this is what's so missing um, from our understanding of Porter's life is these newspaper reports that talk about his exhibitions and, and um, encourage people to support him, but really what was the other side of the coin. Also, um, you know, beyond the reason why I chose Frederick Douglass, for those of you who don't know, is he was the most commonly photographed individual in the 19th century. And this is in part a reflection of this new medium called photography. And it started out with the, the daguerreotype and evolved to the tintype. So when we think about um, how capturing one's likeness all of a sudden has a brand new format in the form of photography, we're no longer limited to oil paintings. Um, I think that's really eye-opening. And based on a recent exhibition at the Wadsworth Athenaeum, highlighting Frederick Douglass's time in Hartford and this astounding collection of 19th century daguerreotypes, we have come to appreciate the work of Augustus Washington with greater detail. And Washington is someone who had a studio in Hartford just before Charles Ethan Porter. And on the right, we have a yet to be identified sitter and an unidentified artist, but to show you that um, daguerreotypes and photography were a little bit of a leveler and that people of all different backgrounds and all different means could eventually um, obtain their likeness and it, it, it didn't have to be in oil. So I include uh, this great um, advertisement for Augustus Washington studio he was one of the most successful daguerreotypists in the country in the 19th century, and his studio was literally across the street from where the Wadsworth Athenaeum is. So it's exceptional, the success that he had, but ultimately, after several years in Hartford, he moves his family to Liberia in West Africa and is uh, really more comfortable in, in that setting than in uh, New England. Also in Hartford, there were a number of art schools, artist studios, and places where you could learn art. And some of Charles Ethan Porter's experiences were likely shaped by his proximity to these places. On the screen on the right, you see the Cheney Building. It has a couple different names, whether you're familiar with Hartford or not. Uh, the Ballerston Building, the Cheney Building. Um, we know for a fact people like Porter, uh, maintained a studio in this building at various moments in time. There's uh, ads in the newspapers for the Art School of the Art Society of Hartford, which in its original form was started by people um, like Elizabeth Colt and Mrs. Charles Dudley Warner, founded in um, 
1877, at the same time when Porter sets up his studio. And ultimately that um, institution became known as the Hartford Art School, which is actively thriving today. So to set the scene that there, there really was a lot going on in Hartford and there was great opportunity for patronage. Someone like Charles Noel Flagg, who also tried his hand at still life painting, um, was from a family of artists and found his way back to Hartford to set up his studio as a portrait painter. And so uh, one of his most well-known pieces is this portrait of Mark Twain. So knowing that Hartford really was quite promising to artists at, um, you know, in Charles Ethan Porter's uh, era. So this is how we get to Porter. You can see the date on these works, 1880, um, 1890. So thinking of the, the Porter still life, excuse me, the flag still life, here we have one of the first um, <clears throat> really praise locally or, or praise um, in the art amateur for Charles Ethan Porter. Yes, he's referred to as a Negro artist, a very common terminology at the time, but noting the finesse and accuracy of touch with his work. So when we look at Charles Ethan Porter's works, these early experimental works, which you see here include these incredible incredible, incredible detailed still lifes, almost uh, sort of akin to uh, scientific illustration. And I can say the Wadsworth Athenaeum's holdings are more kind of fully formed porter still lifes of fruit and flowers. But just to see this experimental period where he's trying his hand at different styles, he's obviously an accomplished draftsman. He does complete portraits, as you can see with the two sketches um, in the middle and on the right. And it's from there that Porter actually really cuts his teeth in Hartford and he gains early praise for his fruit pictures and more specifically his pictures of apples. And what kind of defines this as an early work is um, it's actually his attempt at setting um, these apples on the ground in a naturalistic setting. So we haven't quite gotten to um, placing things on a tabletop or in a vase, but it is where um, critics are noting the glowing color and um, appreciating this naturalistic setting. So I'm just gonna show you some of the works in the Wadsworth collection. We also have Mountain Laurel. You can see from several years later, very different stylistically. And what happens between really um, 1880 and um, 1885 is Porter goes to Paris and he spends um, several years studying in Paris. Now this is where um, Mark Twain is uh, quite supportive. He sends a porter with a letter of introduction, which um, he then used to establish himself uh, in Paris. Ironically, in order to get to Paris, Porter has an auction of his own paintings, purportedly a hundred uh, paintings he's sold to raise money to get himself to Paris. The proceeds from that auction were almost $1,100, which Sounds like a lot of money, but within a short period of time, Porter is um, struggling financially. And it's thought that potentially Twain um, supported Porter financially. That's kind of been disputed in, in different scholarship, but really important to know that Porter's time in Paris certainly impacts um, his style. And as you can see, there are, um, you know, subjects that he, consistently um, depicts, such as Mountain Laurel. Again, the Wadsworth picture circa 1885 on the left. You can see the Smithsonian piece, a different treatment of light, a uh, little more contrast between light and shadow, more clearly defined um, flower buds and a kind of um, really kind of complicated if you think about the fact that you have um, buds at different stages and some are broken and, and on the support surface. And um, really there's incredible praise for Porter, mostly uh, through, excuse me, in the, in the middle of the 1800s. And you can see, um, you know, talking in, in incredible kind of hyperbole, um, you know, you, you can't miss this. And um, 
yet still kind of qualifying him thinking, oh, well, he was promising a few years ago and now he's fulfilling that promise. And I'm not entirely sure, you know, what accounts for that uh, perspective. Um, certainly he's proven himself. If already he's sold a hundred paintings um, about five years earlier, I would say, you know, it's, it's accomplishment and it's perseverance. And he's probably, um, you know, grateful for the praise, but it still feels a little um, like, eh, you know, maybe we can let that go. What I do love about this quote too, is that um, the suggestion to put um, his paintings in bright sunshine, and that's the crucial test, which I would say is true for any good painting. And then evolving even further, um, Porter is back in New York briefly, um, it is believed that he may have had um, some kind of stroke. Um, actually, I think I skipped mentioning that. It's believed that he had some sort of a stroke, um, some health issues in the 1870s, which contributed to him opening a studio in Hartford. He is back and forth um, between Europe and then uh, returns to Hartford after, um, as I said, after those years in Paris. And, it's believed that um, when Frederick Church um, visited Porter at one point in 1879, he called him the greatest, uh, the best colorist in the country, which is pretty astounding. It's also believed that from there, um, Church may have suggested Porter try landscape painting, which Porter is known to have done. You can see this example in the top of your screen, landscape with grain stacks. But Really, when we think about what makes a great landscape painting, particularly with um, the significance of people like Cole, Church, Bierstadt, um, I mean, so many other landscape painters, they're going to incredible destinations. And to get to those destinations, they um, are either underwritten, financed, or they have their own means to do so. And it's quite possible that Porter's commitment to still life was very economical in nature. It's believed that his time in Rockville, you know, visiting family yielded an abundance of inspiration in the form of his mother's garden, um, you know, local fruit. There are all kinds of interesting aspects of the genre of still life that are both possibly um, biographical um, or maybe have a, a kind of greater significance, maybe more than we realize. On the screen, Hollyhocks is, uh, we think from a later period, you know, that that uh, mountain moral picture was a little subdued. Here we have this beautiful, beautiful treatment of light, um, incredible impressionistic brushstrokes. Uh, a real kind of um, tour de force in terms of Porter's style, which also kind of complicates the ability to say, well, what, you know, what works date to when. I, I really um, noted there's huge varieties in the way he signs his pieces. Some are unsigned. So the kind of connoisseurship of Porter, if you've at all tried, is a little tricky. I'm not going to lie. Um, certainly there's, um, a kind of look and feel to some of his works. Others are just kind of almost anomalies. I mean, the landscape with grain stacks it feels so, so different. And, you know, by 1898, which is the date of uh, what uh, you see on this, on the screen, this announcement of Mr. Charles Ethan Porter exhibition of fruit, flower, and landscape paintings. So landscape paintings, they are shown um, in Hartford. Here we see the exhibition is at the YMCA building. Um, I should also pause to say there was an incredible gallery, um, Vorses Gallery, which marketed um, all kinds of American artists from Sanford Robinson Gifford to Daniel Wentworth um, to people like Charles Ethan Porter, marketing to both well-to-do um, Hartfordites as well as um, middle-class um, middle-class families and homes. But here, you know, we're kind of rounding out Porter's career in 1898. This is one of his last solo shows in Hartford. 
He his work is still shown um, notably uh, in some group shows. There's an organization called the Connecticut Academy of Fine Arts that's um, at this point, you know, showing people like Child Hassam um, and William Brandegee, some some other uh, individuals more akin to kind of the impressionistic um, Connecticut impressionism. But really, by 1898, um, Porter isn't. Um, I believe he's largely maintaining a studio in Rockville. And I mentioned someone like Daniel Wentworth. Daniel Wentworth is um, perhaps not super well known. Uh, I think in the in the annals of history, uh, in terms of 19th century American landscape painters, his his name is certainly there. But Wentworth and Porter have a group show in um, the late 1890s. And at that point, there's um, a lot of praise for Wentworth. I don't think Porter's landscapes went over very well. And there's a, a kind of shift in the reception of Porter. Um, I also wanted to bring up the fact that there are um, other artists of color working at this time, um, some of whom I would say are are much better known. Um, someone like Robert Duncanson, for example, this is a work in, in our collection. Uh, at the bottom, uh, Edward Mitchell Bannister. Each of these individuals, for various reasons, perhaps have greater recognition and um, have been, their legacies are, are better well known. Duncanson in particular, um, he, again, these are artists um, whose own backgrounds are, are typically mixed race, um, sometimes passing, um, you know, skin light enough that they're passing as white, but still navigating really, really, really tricky territory in the post-Civil War moment. Duncanson lived and worked in a variety of places, but it included um, Detroit and Cincinnati and among his patrons, um, some but not all were abolitionists and um, really benefiting from major patronage in those cities, which enabled them to travel and, you know, especially with Duncanson, complete some incredible compositions. Duncanson clearly is, um, you know, referencing Thomas Cole and, and is paying homage to Cole, but also contributing to this incredible moment for American landscape painting in his own right, and ultimately um, spends time in Canada, um, really during and after the Civil War. So the experience he had as a person of color in the Midwest and traveling in different parts of the country ultimately um, led him to, to spend time in, in Canada. And then, of course, Edmonia Lewis, if you don't know, she's an incredible sculptor. She too had a uh, mixed race ancestry with um, both black and Native American heritage. And she is someone, um, even uh, I should say Bannister and Lewis are exhibiting um, at really, uh, and Duncanson are exhibiting an incredible, incredible um, national exhibitions. Lewis in particular showed at the Philadelphia Centennial in 1876. Um, none of these artists, however, were included in the um, World's Columbian Exhibition ex Exposition in 1893, and there's a great book um, that addresses why there were no Black artists in that show. So it's a little inconsistent uh, when and where they are receiving recognition. On the right, um, This Quirky Horse by Nelson Primus. For those of you that don't know, um, the Primus family was a really significant family, Black family in Hartford, and um, Nelson Primus uh, was one of their children, um, one of the Primus children, and he went on to have a successful career as a painter. So that connectivity to Hartford and Hartford breeding talent, um, I just want to encourage you to, to kind of be expansive beyond Frederick Church and beyond just Porter. There's a there's a kind of density there that's really exciting. And it does reveal that there were um, two significant black churches in Hartford. There were several black families. Of course, Hartford is shaped uh, as well by immigration at this time. And there's a huge influx of Irish immigrants to the city. And so 
the experience um, that any of these um, kind of minority families had is, is certainly got to be challenging and worth, um, you know, kind of reflecting on. And then I kind of just wanted to bring us up to how recently scholars considered Porter to be lost and forgotten to history. Um, you know, I'm very fortunate to work at a, a museum that has an astounding American art collection. And the Porters that we have were mostly gifts uh, in the late 90s. So in 1987, I, I don't know um, really how many works kind of came out of the woodwork because of a call um, for um, help and work and information like this in 1987. Certainly from here, there was indeed, I don't know if you can see, there was an exhibition of Porter's work at the Old State House in Hartford, and then a major touring exhibition um, years later um, presented uh, at the New Britain Museum of American Art here in Connecticut, also went to the Studio Museum in, in Harlem, as well as several other venues. And really the call for Porter, I think still stands. Um, I've heard anecdotally about families that um, only recently realized they, they had a Porter in their collection and, and the significance of that and um, really the hope to excavate some letters or other primary source material really is, um, it's, it's quite fresh. And I wanted to offer um, just a few examples of recently acquired works on the screen, Thistles with Butterfly, um, acquired by the Delaware Art Museum last year. And the Wadsworth Athenaeum is very fortunate to acquire um, chrysanthemums on the screen, which is one of the largest paintings Porter uh, ever completed. Um, it's, it's almost 30 by 40, whereas a lot of the other works are about half that size. And each of these, interestingly enough, I always pays to look on the back of a painting, um, the label on the left is not the one that's on the Delaware's uh, Delaware Museum's painting, but they did note that the Eckhart uh, name, the frame maker, with noted frame maker uh, in downtown Hartford, um, kind of gives some uh, suggestion that provenance and, and history of the work. And similarly, chrysanthemums had a label on the verso from a frame shop in Springfield, Massachusetts. So that kind of forensics is another level of well, you know, we don't know much about a work, but we can look on the back and try to um, piece together a little bit of provenance that way. And in terms of still life as a genre in American art, ooh, it's a very deep, deep, deep discussion that's um, still ongoing about some of the stereotype um, that are perpetuated um, through um, some of the kind of racist stereotypes that emerge in certain subject matter. Um, Porter himself um, is known to have painted watermelon. And um, scholars are now, you know, sort of looking at some of Porter's works and a lot of still life um, subjects through the lens of, you know, social, uh, political, racial motivation. I don't know if Porter um, would have recognized this to be as such a loaded choice of fruit. My guess is um, that's quite possible. But what I find fascinating is the contemporary uh, photographer, Zora Murph, is revisiting that possibility and in his own work, um, really bringing to light questions of visibility and invisibility when it comes to, um, and, and really narratives, who's making the narrative, whose narrative are we um, aware of when we look at 19th century still life and genre painting. And in terms of, you know, purposeful subject matter, mountain laurel is the Connecticut state flower. And I can't help but think that, you know, for Porter's clientele, that may have meant something. And so there would be a, a, a real motivation to paint um, that subject, uh, that flower specifically. But also how interesting 
to come back um, or to, to bring that forward. And I don't know how many of you were aware of this incredible exhibition um, at the Glass House, the Philip Johnson Modernist House in New Canaan, Connecticut, had a little bit of an intervention, well, actually a huge intervention, you could say, engaging the contemporary artist, David Hart, who looked through scores and scores of Porter's works and planted um, flower gardens that were blooming from spring to summer based on um, flowers that appear in Porter's paintings. And I just, I think that's really fascinating. It gives great visibility to someone like Porter. And within the campus of the Glass House, there is a gallery and there were examples of Porter's work, Porter works on display uh, in the gallery as well. So you didn't only have this kind of narrative of the landscape and lived um, exposure to, um, I guess, Porter's works coming to life, but then you got to see um, how, you know, how talented he, he, talented he was as a still life painter. And um, just uh, Sylvia Yant had a fantastic quote, and I thought I'd conclude with that, that, um, you know, heart centering of Porter as a subject of inspiration for a colored garden underscores the relevance of a reconsideration of Porter's still life production and his three decade career. So I would say reconsideration, um, deep inquiry, uh, really the connectivity between Porter and someone like Frederick Church is so eye-opening. Um, I, I have so many questions about, you know, Church's motivation to acquire work by Porter um, you know, what were his intentions and is there any chance that we can locate the Porter works that were purportedly in, in Church's collection? Um, so I hope you can appreciate now Porter was indeed a Hartford artist, but he was also so, so much more. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erin. That was just so wonderful to kind of dive in. Um, and think about the ways in which I love how you put that. Um, he was a Hartford artist, but so much more. And I, I, I just, you know, it's so it's so fascinating the way in which you ended um, your presentation, highlighting some of the ways that contemporary artists are using Porter as a kind of springboard to talk about contemporary issues. I think, I guess, a question that I have, which you know, I, you know, maybe is food for thought for all of us. But I, I guess I wonder, um, why do you think Porter is calling to some of these artists and practitioners? And what do you think about his work um, really draws and elicits something in artists like David Hart, who we were so fortunate to work with for our terraforming exhibition last year, um, which was just such a pleasure, but as well as some of the artists that you you were pointing out um, as well. You know, I don't know if you have thoughts on that. Yeah, that's right. And and I have that catalog from um, him excavating the photographs um, at Olana, which is astounding. Um, you know, I, I think... And I'm excited just that the field of American art, um, American visual culture, you know, it's it's calling for a kind of expansive look at the artists that have really been championed um, quite legitimately, people like Frederick Church and Thomas Cole, um, but who has been marginalized and why? Um, and I, I also, I mean, part of my own sort of um, appreciation of spending time with Porter is to just ask new questions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what, what, what were their experiences like? And more than just being an accomplished still life painter, you know, what were some of the disadvantages that had to be kind of overcome and a degree of, of perseverance to, to, to keep at it. Um, so it's both, it's really an expansive, more expansive view. Uh, I don't want to say inclusive because I think it's really hard to include everyone's perspective in the 19th century, but um, broadening our, our, our look at the artists that we spend a lot of time um, getting to know. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we have some questions coming in and pouring in. So feel free, folks, if you have questions of your own, um, please use the Q&A function to, to submit them. Um, one question that came in from our wonderful president of the Alana Partnership, Sean Sawyer. Um, such a fascinating lecture. Thank you, Erin. As you note, 
Porter's focus on still life speaks to the limitations on his ability to travel to far flung lo far flung locales like Church was able to do. Um, but he could have perhaps painted regional landscapes or genre scenes such as Wentworth. So um, Sean is wondering if there was some advantage to still life that called to him, perhaps the saleability, the interior decoration mm -hmm. possibility, or if perhaps there was an element of symbolism that could be coded into them, like with Dutch still life. I know that you. Um, talked a little bit about that at the end, kind of some of the, the ways that we might negotiate some of the symbolism today. So I don't know if you have if you have further thoughts on that. Well, I, I sort of have two points. One is true. Many artists, um, you know, living and working, you could say Hartford, you could say Springfield, you know, in in urban areas that maybe um, didn't go to far flung places there was accessibility uh, via the trolley to go to uh, more rural landscapes. Like I'm thinking of Farmington, Connecticut, which really wasn't a far venture. And um, Porter could have easily done that. It wouldn't have been very expensive or time consuming. So, you know, that's a backwards way of saying still life does seem to be very deliberate. Um, I can't help but think Mountain Laurel was a very purposeful selection. Um, certainly Porter is, is painting local flora and fauna. And I do think that there's a marketability there mm -hmm. that was, um, very deliberate. Um, I know at the end of his life, he, he still was really, really financially burdened and was possibly selling pictures door to door. So some of it may have been, um, he had received praise and kept you know, thought, well, if I can do more of that and I can own my technique, I'll keep at it. But there are definitely some um, unusual subject matter choices as well. There's um, some early Trump Loy works that are like insects on a plate, uh, which kind of contradict some of the more beautiful kind of picturesque floral arrangements. So once he got going, though, I, I think there's, I don't know if the symbolism is there, but I'd like to think they're there may have been or there may have been a real familiarity with his surroundings. Mm, mm. That's fascinating, too, to think about, you know, you you paint and you engage with what you're most familiar with. Um, you know, I think you could conjecture the the the, the, the um, impetus be behind the subject matter. You know, like you pointed out at the very beginning, there's so many questions that we still have about so an artist like Porter. And I think that that's what makes um, this such a such a kind of thought provoking presentation. So thank you. With that in mind, we had a we had a um, comment that came in from Christine Oaklander. So just a, a comment about the the watermelon as well, thinking a little bit about that trope and thinking about some of the um, really complicated symbolism there. Um, perhaps there was some some kind of complications and some nuance there. In fact. Um, during the Civil War and emancipation, many folks of color viewed watermelon as a sign of self-sufficiency. Um, perhaps it was something that was kind of turned into a stereotype. And so Christine is wondering if maybe that was something that Porter was actually taking up and thinking about. Um, but once again, questions, questions, questions. Yeah, I, I you know, it's, it's certainly an interesting choice. And um, I, I think I've only come across two watermelon works by him. Um, so yeah, you, you wonder. Um, I know, for example, Robert Duncanson, um, who is better known as a landscape painter, but did dabble in still lifes. There's a great article on his still life that really deconstructs his choice of um, vegetables and fruit. Um, mm -hmm at tying it into, you know, like Ohio trade and really having a sense that there was um, some purpose there. And I, I just, I think we can just raise the questions with Porter. Um, I also find it interesting that he did do figural works, mm -hmm. but he didn't stick with that. And again, is that, is that American taste? Is that mm. New England taste? And, or was, were the, were there, no, was there no patronage? You know, it's sort of like, were there well-to-do Black families that were able to afford oil paintings? I, I, 
it's it's complicated. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think with so much of this re-examination, I mean, so much of our kind of um, re-interrogation of artists living in this time period, the 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 market, the finance, the commerce comes into it. And I think um, you bring up such, a, such an interesting point, was there a market? We had a question that came in um, from Sharon Smith that's kind of similar, in a similar vein. Did Porter ever paint portraits of his family? So even if there might not have been a market for other portraits um mm. was that ever anything that he took up to your mm. knowledge i've i've not come across any yeah. that's a really good question actually <laughs> yeah seems like an obvious you know start there but i wonder yeah um another thing that came through you know just once again thinking about um, his work as a as a teacher. So we had a question from one of our listeners, Rana. The restaurant photograph is of him and his students. Where did he teach and for how long? So just mm, yep. So um, he, I believe, he taught later in life. Um, and he, so when he, he sort of, I think his last ten to fifteen years, he's in Rockville, Connecticut. And um, his brother, one of his brothers, who was very successful, um, took up the land and actually built um, like a viewing tower, very similar to Daniel Wadsworth's Montevideo, for those of you mm. that know that. Um, and Porter actually maintained a studio in the viewing tower. But I believe there were, uh, he was mentoring and teaching in Rockville, some younger artists. So he largely, whether or not that was financially lucrative I don't know again I think it's purported that he died really impoverished um, but there was um, and there may have been some time when he was in Hartford where he was dabbling and teaching but I think mm. it was that's a very that's a late photo you know he dies in um, 1923 and that photo is 1911 so okay it's interesting thinking a little bit about um, you know so much of this this market and creating how much we're thinking about the commerce of the artist as well. You know, I just, it brings to mind the current exhibition that we have on view, which talks a little bit about church and the ways in which he was kind of self-promoting and marketing um, some of his work, just the the techniques and the practices that artists engage in to, to self-sustain. And with that in mind, um, we had a comment from Alan Wallach come in. Um, is it possible that Porter, like other artists, perhaps specialized because of the workings of the art market, which can tend to foster specialization? So thinking back to 17th century Dutch little masters um, who worked in a country which had the first modern art ma market, perhaps sex success in one genre drives demand for additional mm -hmm. examples so I don't know if you have other well I, I mean I often think about um you know the the evolution of landscape painting literally from coal to Innis you know where we get that kind of um you know taste evolves in the kind of 1870s 1880s but you know if you think about American still life painting I mean we're going back to the Peel family. And there is really this endurance of that as a genre. Mm -hmm. Certainly the critics noted once Porter had come back from Paris, oh, you know, his, his work is akin to the French masters and um, people like Fatin Latour were, you know, there was, even though it was, you know, kind of American flowers and fruit, um, there was a kind of Europeanizing of the still life genre that appealed to certain, a certain class of Americans, you know, that who okay. themselves maybe wanted to, you know, have kind of aspirations of European collecting. Um, so it it is, it's one of those genres that's endured. It hasn't always been, you know, the go-to, but it's certainly endured. And um throw in a little trompe l'oeil and it becomes, you know, this kind of coveted, um, specialized um, area of expertise. Mm -hmm. There's a stability there. In yeah, that. yes. Yeah. That's a, yep. Interesting. So I know we're, you know, we're nearing the end of our time this evening. So if anyone has any remaining questions, feel free to uh, send them in in our last moments. But I do just want to clarify, you know, this, this um, idea of, of church, a church, a Porter that church owned what do we know just so that we can kind of finalize um you know everybody's thinking on that and and if you want to clarify um yeah good yeah what do we know what don't we know what do we need to know <laughs> right well so based on um again the 
existing scholarship where it's often footnoted, you know, church visited Porter in his studio. Um, there's at least two accounts of church either commenting on Porter and or um, commenting and then acquiring Porter. Hmm. And um, one of the more interesting articles, it's it's late, it's from 1893, and it was originally published in a Detroit newspaper that talked about um, rising um, Black artists. And it lists several um, noted collectors that acquired work by Porter, including, so it was, the list included Frederick Church, Mark Twain, Elizabeth Colt. Now, mind you, we have the Colt bequest, and there is no Porter in the Colt bequest. And um, the silk manufacturers, also Connecticut notables, the Cheney brothers. And so I have my feelers out. We know t Mark Twain House has better record keeping um, for potential maybe inventory or acquisitions. And I've been in touch um, with the archivist at Alana, and there, there isn't quite the paper trail. Um, and again, if it was an unsigned porter and it mm -hmm. isn't a rat, you know, how are we mm -hmm. ever going to know? But Sean and Betsy and I are we're, we're on following it. the lead that there's possibly <laughs> one somewhere. Um, but it's been really hard to validate that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, so stay tuned, I guess. Well, thank you, Erin. I think that this has been such a wonderful reminder that, you know, history is living. And I think there's so much more for us to learn and so much more for us to discover, whether it's artists like Porter, who I think maybe go unacknowledged for too long, yeah. or whether it's little morsels of um, tracks of inter the interrelationship of artists that we're just starting to discover. So I think this was a wonderful reminder that there's always, always so much more to learn. So thank you. Always more threads to pull. Yeah. Absolutely. What a pleasure. Thank you. Have a lovely Bye. evening, everyone. And, and thank you again for joining us. Thanks for tuning in. Bye-bye.